Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast. Steve Hoffman's here. Great to see you, Steve. Fantastic to be here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually switch switcheroo here from uh, Steve has also a, a, another name. Tell us your other name. My actually gamer handle is Captain Hoff, and it has become my nickname. So Captain Hoff is in the house, and he's dialing in from across the seas, uh, from uh, San Francisco, I believe you are. That is correct. So he's uh, coming in, and in fact, you might be the furthest away podcast I've held. I had somebody in Barbados one time, um, but now it's San Francisco. He's further away than Barbados. Yes. My house. So, so we um, qualify. We have qualified for the most further away. And, and, and Captain Hoff is a bit of a legend, not only in Silicon Valley, where he is currently, but also in Hollywood. And we'll get onto that maybe. Um, he's the chairman and CEO of Founders Space, a global innovation hub for entrepreneurs, corporations, and investors with over 50 partners in 22 countries. He's a venture investor and a founder of three venture backed and two bootstrapped startups and the author of several award-winning books. The latest, published by HarperCollins, is Surviving a Startup, which is I'm very interested about because I, I'm still trying to survive my startup 20 years in. Um, I, I, he had more careers than cats have lives, I've read somewhere. Is that right? That is correct. I've been everything from a Hollywood TV executive to an, a voice actor to an electrical engineer. You name it. I've done it. Game designer, studio head. That's it's amazing. So, and I love that because there's a part in, in, in Surviving a Startup where he talks about experience and how that helps you on the path of being a founder. And I think someone with such an eclectic experience is, is so interesting to get into it. I'm really fascinated, fascinated to explore it. So he's a mover and shaker, not only in Silicon Valley, but also Hollywood. And he's a prolific podcaster. If you check him out, founder space, mentors and masters and an international public speaker. So he's, he's, he's so, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast and so much amazing stuff to get into. But before I forget, I always forget, please don't uh, forget to check out my company, The Tech Department, who sponsor this podcast. That's the one I blew up. And we did bring it back, and it's actually having a really fantastic uh, uh, 2022. So that's great news. Um, but I don't want to do that again. That's why I'm speaking to Captain Hoff and amazing entrepreneurs like him. So please help us spread the word. Give us a great review. Share it. Pass it on. Tell your friends. Uh, we're trying to do a good thing here, helping entrepreneurs like you listening in today. So we're going to dive in and go straight into it because I believe Captain Hoff you were always this illustrious entrepreneurial leader. You were, you had a, a, a sort of start where you you had a first attempt to raise some venture capital. And I believe there's this bit of a story around, around what happened. Yes, it's quite a tale. It's a saga. So actually, my first startup was a bootstrapped company. And we did really well, very successful. Then I was crazy enough to go out and raise venture capital for my second company. And for my second company, uh, we had this dream that we would make interactive television. Now, we had this server system that one of our co-founders had built out himself. It was this massively multi-user gaming service system. And this was in the beginning of when there weren't these, everybody played games as solo. They weren't really playing. So when, when was this? Well, what year was this? Do you, do you remember? This was the 1990s. Right. Yeah. So the 1990s, kind of uh, late 1990s, we were out there and we decided um, we were looking, we had this technology and we we're looking for a market, which is always a bad thing to do. <laughs> you can, it's better to find the market and build the tech than yeah. to actually build the tech and then say, wow, how can we make money? And we went through several iterations of this. And finally, we came to the idea that we were going uh, to contact MTV, the Viacom, the big American television company, because they had announced publicly that they wanted to do an, the, the first huge interactive TV show. And we got the idea that we could take this gaming server and synchronize online content to TV broadcasts frame accurate although we had never done it. <laughs> we just had one piece of the equation. So naturally, what do you do when you're an entrepreneur? Well, you, f you start calling 
your customer. So we started calling the senior vice president of MTV Interactive. And we left voicemails saying, we are Spider Dance. We are this amazing company. We have <laughs> this fantastic technology that we want to use. And you know what happened? He never called us back. <laughs> he, he didn't know who the hell Spider Dance is, and he did not want to call us back. One of my partners, uh, she was actually, and this was like the mid, I, I should say it was the mid 90s. It was like we started in 94 and we're heading into 95 and his early days of the internet. And she was invited uh, to CES to give a talk from her previous job. And so she got on this panel and she decided to talk about what we we're doing now since she, we had launched a startup and she starts to tell the audience, you know, how we, you know, our vision is to synchronize television to online content and we have this server system. And when she's done with her talk, this guy comes barreling up from the audience, pushes through all the people and says, I need to talk to you. I am the senior vice president of MTV Interaction, Interactive, and you have exactly what we need. Oh, wow. <laughs> And you know what she said? I know, we've been leaving voicemails for you all month. <laughs> so serendipity knocks. Uh, we literally uh, sign a deal with them in a couple of weeks. And we get the money in the bank and we're off and rolling. We're like, that was fantastic. That was easy. Well, we didn't know what was ahead of us because it wasn't that easy. Like we got the initial, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. We had a 10 person team, like working like crazy, you know, to build this thing. We are on a really tight timeline. So since we hadn't even built the technology nor tested it, nor had it ever been done before in the way we were doing it, we, you know, we, we, they, MTV kept saying, can your, company, the spider dance thing actually make this? Whoa, no problem. No problem. We can make it because of course it was the only business we had. <laughs> and so we're scrambling, trying to make it. Meanwhile, we're also trying to raise more money because they didn't give us that much money and we knew we were going to run out. So, so I'm running around to all the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, knocking on doors and None of them are answering. They're not opening their doors. <laughs> they don't know me. It's the early days of the internet. You have to remember this is the 1990s. Uh, they didn't have incubators. They didn't have, you know, venture capitals were like, they were very reluctant to talk to somebody that they didn't really know or wasn't introduced to them. And I was nobody. So uh, I, I wasn't getting any traction. Finally, I got one guy and he said he was interested. And I was like, oh my God, somebody loves me. You know, they're interested. You know, <laughs> I wanted to hug the guy. And he, uh, you know, he kept, he's this angel investor and he was like really interested and he kept saying he would fund us, but he never funded. He like, like he would just ask every time we met, I'd like if I, he would ask for more information. And when I gave him more information, he always had questions. Like, and when I would have like, oh, you need this spreadsheet? I'll make this spreadsheet. You need this you need that data? I'll get that data. And at the end of the day, he would just, he wouldn't invest. <laughs> so we were dying. Finally, I got this introduction to a, a, what was a new venture capital firm in LA, in Hollywood. I thought this is a perfect fit. And it had, you know, these big shots on the board, you know, the, the, the head of like Universal. Yeah, they also had Michael Milken, the junk bong king, you know, the former head of Sega. All these big shots of the time were on this board. We go in, we pitch them, and they were like, we love it. Perfect fit for us. We're, we're going to fund you. So we get a lawyer and we uh, work out all the contracts. We kind of run up 60K in legal bills, which was a lot for us, like a lot of money. And uh, we get everything done. The contract is done. And then we go, okay, fund us. Like, you know, we're, we're getting ready to launch this. We, we need the money. We're spending all our money. And they go, well, you know, right now you're so close to launch. We want to see if your product works. <laughs> we want to see the launch. So we're going to wait. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> well, we'll wait <laughs> because we didn't have a choice. Like we had nobody else lined up. They were our only guy. And so we decided we wait and we just focus on making the product. 
Now, so we know everything's hanging on the launch of our product. And the problem is in these days, they had no AWS, no cloud hosting, no way to load test, really load test something before it launched. We were building like this scalable, massively multi-user server system, which we couldn't even really test. (laughs) And we, big MTV kept calling us like, television doesn't crash. Television doesn't crash. Remember this. We, we are driving a lot of traffic to your server the day of launch. It doesn't crash. <laughs> so we're like, we understand it doesn't crash. Um, <laughs> and the server system is just, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we only have like three engineers. <laughs> <laughs> They're working. They don't have a, we, we, we get this kind of co-location facility in New Jersey where we're setting up our own T1 line and stuff. It's all hand done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it was the old days. Um, and we put it all together. Meanwhile, MTV is barraging the network, the television network, and they were huge at the time with ads for us, with like ads, full screen ads, come to Web Riot, the biggest first interactive TV show, come to Web Riot, you know, everywhere. And we're like, okay, it better work. So we get it all together. We uh, put it up there. The day of launch comes and we launch it. And before the show, there's a countdown. People just start, massive numbers of people start hitting our server at the same time. And we're like, please hold on. And we're getting, and you know, the clock's ticking, the show's about to go. And all of a sudden, our worst nightmare comes true. The servers go down <laughs> right before the launch of the show. Oof. I get a phone call. It's none other than the senior vice president of MTV. <laughs> and he is none too happy. He, every four letter word is coming out of his mouth. <laughs> he can conjure up. <laughs> what the blank, blank, blank is happening? I told you television doesn't go down. It doesn't crash. <laughs> I will, Hold on a minute. Let me talk to my engineers. Hold on. <laughs> So my engineers are in New Jersey. I'm on the West Coast in San Francisco. I get on the phone to them and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> the servers are down. And they go, we are actually under a denial of service attack. Hackers are attacking us. <laughs> and they had no, we had no like sophisticated, uh, you know, firewalls or things like this in those days. Like it was all hacked together, this thing. And we were, and they're like, we are manually trying to block them. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, their IP addresses, like figuring out where the attacks are coming from. And literally, literally, like, literally, like one of those kind of 90s sci fi, like kind of spy movies where there's, a, yeah, yeah. there's an attack and we're deleting the spiders and yeah, all that. Yeah. And the servers are down and MTV's freaking out. Five minutes later, the servers go back up right before the launch of the show. Oof. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> the servers were up and they stayed up. And the show ran flawlessly. And we were like, oh, we did it. And everything calmed down. MTV was really happy. The second show ran flawlessly. The third one ran flawlessly. The hackers didn't come back. We, we had figured it out. We handled the whole load, like a massive load that had never been done before. Like it was like, you know, after I think the first month, we had a million users, like in the, and so it was just enormous for the time. Like that was, it's big now. It was huge yeah, yeah, yeah. for the time. So we, uh, things weren't great. The first thing I do is we're totally out of money. <laughs> so I call up the investors and say, you know, it ran flawlessly. You know, MTV loves us. We're going to sign up other customers. We have A&E in the works and all this stuff. Write us the check. They were, they're like, okay, great. We'll fund you. But we've been thinking. I was like, oh, no, not thinking again. We <laughs> want to cut your valuation in half. And I was like, but it ran perfectly. <laughs> we did everything we said we would do. They go, no, we want to cut it in half because they knew they aren't called vulture capitalists for no reason. They knew we were totally out of money because we had told them we nearly need the money. <laughs> and so we are between, you know, a rock and a hard place. And I had a choice to make. I could, you know, just take the money at half the valuation and then we're fine. Like, you know, we get our $5 million, we're off to the races. Or I could say, screw you, <laughs> you guys are jerks, and I am walking. <laughs> and you know what I did? I said, screw you, you guys are jerks, I'm walking. <laughs> good for you. I walked, I walked out the door and it felt so good until I stepped outside. And I realized 
we have no money. We have no other investors. It is right before the holidays, the, the, the Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa holidays, and all the investors are going away. <laughs> they are all leaving. What do we do? We have to run this show for MTV. We have to pay for the hosting. We have to pay our team. What do we do? It was like pure and utter torture. So this is like when you're doing a startup and you're just like everything <laughs> goes so, bad. So, so this was a kind of, so this was um, in mid, was it 95, you say this was, 95, 96 time. Yeah. And you, you're at Christmas and it's all gone great. So you're at the highest of high. Yeah. And then you go into this meeting and you walk out and you flame that opportunity. You're just looking at the the, the, the holiday season, the Christmas season. And everyone's going away. What, what, so this is you, you kind of almost like suspended in thin air, falling, free falling at this point. How, how are you feeling in that, uh, that moment? I was feeling as I suddenly realized our prospects were very grim for getting funded any time because the investors in Silicon Valley go away and they don't come back until after CES. So that is usually mid-January. And then it takes time to close a deal. So you've got to give yourself a month or two or three. And we're like running out of money. Like, I, so I beg my employees, keep working, keep, keep, please. You know, you can't stop working. So they all agree to keep working. And, and we didn't know what to do. I mean, we literally don't know. And we had made some mistakes. So these are lessons learned. So the first mistake we made was when that angel investor literally uh, did not invest. Remember that? And I write about the, these rules in my Surviving a Startup book so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. But when that person, when I had met with that person three times and they hadn't invested, I should have cut that angel off and not wasted any more time. Any investor that meets with you three times and at the third time, you should ask them, are you going to invest or are you not? And if you aren't, I'm walking. If you give them a chance to stay and look and, and keep in the deal but not invest, you know, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot because literally it's like you go to a home and you see a really nice home and you're like, oh, I could live here. And the real estate agent says, oh, come back later. It'll be available. <laughs> so you're going to go look at other homes. <laughs> you're only going to sell that home if the real estate agent goes, you know, there's a lot of people interested. If you don't come back, we're not showing it to you again. <laughs> like you make your decision now, you will make your decision and then you will know. And honestly, if the invest if, by meeting five, six, seven, it goes up exponentially. Your chance of closing is really high around meeting three. And then it starts to go down, exponentially down. Like, And the more times you meet with him, it does not increase your odds. So that was my first mistake. Wasted a ton of time on you know the early investor that really I shouldn't have been wasting. Second mistake, I get this venture firm that's interested. And when they said they would invest, we invested a lot of money in the legal contract, which turned out to be a total waste of money because we didn't never signed it. We should have literally said to them, the first red flag an investor gives you that they aren't trustworthy, walk away. Don't hold hope. Like hope is your enemy. <laughs> hope is your enemy. <laughs> like It's not your friend. So uh, we should have literally... Uh, uh, when, when they said they, they, they wanted to wait till our product launched and before they had committed to launching, uh, to investing pre-launch, um, we should have said red flag, we're walking away. Then other mistake we made, really important mistake that we made, and it was really, uh, catastrophic is again, we should have, uh, either said, no, you invest now or you don't invest, right? Like we ha you have to be in control as the entrepreneur. You can't let other people dictate the timeline of the deals. Otherwise, they're going to pick what's ever advantageous to them. Like, of course, why wouldn't they want to wait? It de-risks it. If the product fail, then they don't have to invest. If it succeeds, then they invest. So literally, we should have walked away at that time. And the fact that they lowered the valuation in half uh, later on just showed that they were complete jerks. And I did do the right decision there to walk away. You, because you don't want those people, even though it was incredibly painful and kind of stupid, it was also the right decision. Because you don't want those people on your board. They become your partners. Do you want a partner you can't trust? Like, no, we did not want these partners who control our board to be people we don't trust. So we did. So I made one right. This I was started to learn <laughs> what was going on. The next thing I did was I just was relentless. I like kept meeting people. Like I like call and most people wouldn't meet because it was the holidays. Like after Thanksgiving in the U.S., everything kind of shuts down. But one firm, it was called Macromedia at the time. It was uh, 
it was also, um, it was, uh, it had, be- it became Adobe. So Macromedia became yes, Adobe. Yeah. We all know the company, big company. We went uh, to them. I met the president and he was like, he, he, he asked me a question. He says, you know, what you've done with MTV is fantastic. We're launching this new product. It's called Flash. Flash. Can you make this work with Flash? And you know what I said? Absolutely. No problem. Of course. Again, I didn't know if we could make it work with Flash, just like I didn't know we could launch for MTV. But where there's a will, there's a way. And I said, we will make this launch work with Flash. Give us the money. And he said, well, we can't give you the money uh, because we need an established VC firm to lead the round. We can't lead. And we're like, oh. Like, not, not another, like who needs followers? You need a leader. Like all you need is a leader. You don't need followers. Like a lot of people will say, oh, I'll follow the round. They don't, but we did one thing right here. I said, that's okay, but only if you introduce us to the VCs you want to lead the round. So whenever somebody says they want to follow, they don't want to lead, you say, turn around. You don't introduce them to whoever you already have in the pipeline, right? You introduce them uh, to, uh, you get them to introduce you to somebody new. <laughs> expands your pool. And you always, unlike the other investors, you always hint that you have competition. Like with the previous investors, they knew we had nobody. They knew we were running out of money. You don't tell them we're running out of money. We have nobody else but you. You don't get love that way. <laughs> you get rejected. <laughs> you get <laughs> you get squeezed. Um, so we wait. It, it, it turns into mid-January, just like I predicted. Uh, we still have no money. We're running on total fumes total fumes. And he brings us into a venture capital firm. And instead of just introducing us, he actually comes to the pitch with us. The president comes to the pitch with us. And we're like, why is he coming? Like, doesn't he have better things to do? He's like running this company. I figure it out. He's coming to the pitch to hear what the venture firm says. If they poke holes in us, he's not going to introduce us to anybody else. Like it's, this is it. Like, and if they like us, if they give a positive reaction, uh, then he's still on board. So that's why he's here. So he's sitting in the room. The venture guy comes in. I give a pitch. And this time I don't tell them we're running on fumes. I haven't told anybody that. I don't tell, you know, I, I, I just give my pitch, tell them all the great stuff, show them everything. And at the end of my pitch, um, you know, I, 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 I literally at the end of this pitch, I, Look the venture, I look the venture firm in the eye and wait for the answer. And you know what he says? He's completely stone faced. And he says, excuse me, I have to go. I'll be back in 10 minutes. And he just gets up and leaves. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is a bitch. So I'm sitting there looking at the, the president and we're looking back and forth. He doesn't know what's going on. He comes back 10 minutes later. He sits down and he sh- slides a piece of paper over to me and goes, Here's your term sheet. But I don't want to, I don't want to give you $5 million. I want to give you $7 million. Wow. I was like, $7 million. <laughs> oh my God. You're giving me seven. I mean, it's the first meeting. Like I just met you. And, and then, and then I was, then I started to think, I was like, this is strategy. You can't just take the money or they're going to know you're desperate. So I go, we didn't ask for seven million. And it was at the valuation that the other people rejected. So that same valuation. Oh, really? And I go, we, we didn't ask for $7 million. We, we only asked for five. So, but I'll tell you what, I will do you a favor. I will split the difference. We'll take six, but you have to promise me uh, you can close this deal in two weeks. And he goes, done deal. Two weeks. We'll have the, because <laughs> we needed the money yesterday. Yeah, yeah amazing. So, so he literally said, yes, I couldn't believe it. I'd like closed the deal for two weeks of funding. And, um, and you know what? I started to think, why is he doing this? And then I realized I had said one thing during that meeting, which got him to close one thing. And you know what that was? Go for it. That one thing was, I told him, you see uh, the president over there of Macromedia, which is now Adobe, you know, you are the first VC he's introduced us to. I said, those few words, what did that tell him? It told him he was going to walk out and introduce me to more venture capital firms. And he's sitting right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess it's like social proof. You've got the guy, the president guy sat there. So he knows yeah, you've he, got he some credibility. He was in the room. 
Yeah, yeah. And 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 I dropped that they were the first one he is introducing to us, implying that he was about to introduce us yes, to a whole yeah. bunch more, which he had said he would do. And that what drives investors is greed and fear. They want you have to sell them on a, a deal that they really, really want. And then you have to let them know that if they don't make a decision now, that deal is going away. So all the things I didn't do. And that's why I closed the deal. Literally two weeks later, the money was in the bank and we were off to the races. So that is my my roller coaster ride of funding my first venture funded startup. And the story, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that's, that's it's amazing. I mean, you've got some real highs and lows there and it's interesting because in in in, um, in your book you kind of it's actually uh, surviving a startup by the way um uh, captain hoff's book is a a great read for even if you've been running a company or a, a startup for a while but it's got very pointed advice and one of the, the first opening chapters has extremely pointed advice of why you shouldn't launch your own startup and he has a whole suite of fantastic things which all of which you seem to have experienced <laughs> in that three-month window there yes. over that holiday and, period. and i will tell you one of the most important things a lot of people launch a startup because they believe uh, they don't like their boss they don't like their job they want to do something better they you know uh, that is not a good reason to launch a startup because you will be trading no matter how ba bad your boss is no matter what a tyrant that person is, whether they call you on the weekend or whatever they do, make you work late, you will be trading that tyrant in for a far worse tyrant, <laughs> for the worst dictator you have ever worked for, because your boss will be you and you can never escape yourself. In the middle of your night, your boss will be with you in your head, telling you, making you, stressing you out about all the problems you have, making, you know, making you work weekends, making you work nights, never, even on a holiday, your boss will be sitting right next to you. <laughs> it, yep. Never escape that boss. So don't go to escape your boss. I, I really, I, I, I read that line, actually. I, I pulled that out of the line because I thought, yeah, that's, that's like so on the nose because... You I and mean, I have been a terrible tyrant to myself over yes, the years. You would never tolerate if another person was like you are to yourself. You would run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, I, 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 I had issues with depression and all sorts, and and it was one hundred percent because I was beating myself up all the time. Yes, and that was it. So, so my my own self self talk was just so like like vicious, I guess, and just, it like, is harsh. vicious, you know. After I walked away from the deal, of course, you have second doubts, like that first venture firm. Yes. We were in Las Vegas in the rattiest hotel, you know, for CES, the second CES we were attending because we'd already booked our flight and everything. But we had to stay in the worst hotel and we were so depressed we couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> like we, we didn't even want to go to the show. So, you know, just going back to that. So you're in you're at CES or you're hoping to get to CES, but you can't get out of bed because you're so depressed because of this this experience you've just had. Now, now again, you, we can look back and we can laugh now. Yes. But I guess at the time, you weren't laughing, right? You no, had I, this... I was really legitimately depressed. And, you know, the, being doing a startup is really, really hard. That's why I titled my book Surviving a Startup, because you have to survive. You have to be mentally prepared. And there are a lot of rules, you know, and things you need to do. I learned, you talked about beating yourself up. So we, almost all the entrepreneurs I know, we do that, right? Because we're driven people. We wouldn't be an entrepreneur if we weren't, which means we're always pushing ourselves. And when you're pushing yourselves, you are pushing yourselves a lot of times in the wrong way. So you have, one thing I learned is whatever's going to happen, happens. And pushing your, beating yourself up doesn't help you get there. It might feel like you're, 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 you know, you're learning something, but you aren't. You're just repeating what you need to do is look at all the setbacks as kind of an, I like to tell myself I'm living an adventure. Like this is an adventure story with, you know, in every adventure story, the hero is down, you know, multiple times, like, and at the, and at the climax, they get beat right before the climax, they get beaten really down. And then they have to overcome a huge challenge. Well, that is what your startup needs to be, right? It needs, you need, and you have to remember that later, when this is all over, put it in perspective, these will make great stories. So no matter how horrible you feel right now, you will be able to tell somebody about that. And that can get you out of bed when you're Wait, really... Well, it's funny, like, on exactly that point, when I was... So the whole premise of this podcast was the time I flamed my business out back about five years ago. And literally that summer when it all went wrong, I was kind of like really, it was all collapsing everywhere. 
and fire and drama. And I just said, yeah, like every damn autobiography you read of every entrepreneur has a period of time when they've lost their business or nearly lost their business and they've got to go out to the wilderness and come back again and what have you. And, and I thought, yeah, that's just a thing. And that's the price of me acting out the adventure, you know, living the story. It is absolutely the thing. And and so be prepared for this. If you're the type of person who lo- who can feed off wild adventures, who can embrace the craziness in life, great. If you're the type of person who is uh, not very flexible, uh, does not like a lot of stress in their life, likes things very planned and orderly, please don't do a startup. You will be so much happier being in a larger, more stable organization. That's, it's, 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 it's interesting, that whole kind of the person's nature. It's, it goes quite deep, this. Because I think for me, actually, I used to go, I did a lot of backpacking in my 20s. And I, I spent a lot of time around South America in the in the mid 90s, actually, on my own, going literally going on my own to find ruins and jungles. And and when I got back from all that, I was kind of hunting around for something to do and I was trying to find a job and I got my job and I was bored. And I thought I'd go, I want to go on board. I'm going to go traveling again. I want to have an adventure. And actually it turned out I didn't need that. I just needed to set up a company. <laughs> uh, yes. Company was the adventure that I yeah, needed. Yeah, the company can become an adventure. So if you yeah. treat it like that, that's great. I'm not somebody who handles stress well. And you know, a lot of us entrepreneurs aren't. So you have to learn that. You have to learn how to put things in perspective. Really important how to relax, how to let things go and enjoy life because you don't want your whole life and startups, like you think it's going to be fast. You think, oh, I'm going to be that guy who makes a billion dollars, like the crypto guys in, you know, a couple, couple years. Y- you know, it usually drags on for, for a lot longer than you think it does. Yeah, that's very true. And, and I think that's something that's, that's, could we speak on that? Because I think I'll be really interested to hear your perspective on how do you what have you learned to overcome the stress? I mean, you, you can you, you tell the story and it's kind of fun and it's, it's exciting and it's a roller coaster, but you know, there's, that's some dark stuff in there. And, and you've, you've intimated that in terms of the relationship with yourself and handling stress. How, how have you, what tools have you learned to, to, to overcome those stressful situations? So what one thing I've learned is that everything you think really matters in the moment almost invariably doesn't matter in, in your future self. So you have your present self and your future self. And you can do a test right now. I'm sure you've had many stressful moments in the past year. You can't go through life without these moments, right? So whether it's personal relationships, business, doesn't really matter. And it may be moments where you've lost your temper or moments where you felt really down and all these different things. Now, can you even remember those moments? Like if they were six months ago, if they were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, you might remember just a handful of them, like a hand, like less than 1%. So in the moment, and, and then it's never as bad, right? As when, when it was in the moment, like it was really bad, then you might even remember it, but it doesn't feel bad anymore. So what you have to do is project yourself into the future and say, when I'm looking back on this moment, there is a 99.8% chance I won't even remember this. <laughs> Like I'm getting all stressed out about this shipment coming in or this employee problem or this, you know, there's always something in a startup, like always something going wrong. Like I'm not even to remember this conversation I just had with this employee that stressed me out so much. I'm not going to even remember that that shipment didn't come in in time and screwed up our whole plans. I'm not, I didn't, won't even think about it again. Why am I stressing now? <laughs> there's no reason I should just move on. Yeah. And that I- really helps me. Yeah, well, it's interesting to put it into that kind of context. It's very true. I mean, I, and as you say, it, it's like within all these experiences, like the kind of stressful experiences, or, or as you've said, there are lessons in these negative experiences. And I think, in some ways, if you get slightly philosophical about it, because events happen, and you can label them as good or bad, but the point is, is that they just you got to process them and get roll with it. And events are just events. Yes, yeah, and you are just you. And telling yourself negative things about yourself, uh, we all write our own stories. So I write a, we write stories about everybody we know. We tell stories. That's how we understand the world. But we also write a story about ourselves. So we are telling ourselves we're a certain type of person. We have these capabilities. We're telling ourselves we're successful or we're a failure. We can rewrite those stories. It's all in our power. We can do that. But we have to be conscious that we are doing it. 
Because if we aren't conscious, our brains will default to whatever mode. There's some people who have, I guess, an abundance of serotonin who are always happy <laughs> and not stressed out and telling themselves positive stories about whatever. They can go through anything and they seem invulnerable because, you know, they have great brain chemistry. There's other people who, in, and who also would make great entrepreneurs uh, but, you know, aren't blessed with this brain chemistry. So they need to work harder at it. And depending on who you are, you need to understand yourself at a very deep level, a biological level. Like, what does my brain do? What do the chemicals do on a, a personal level? Like, how do I deal with this? Do I make it better or do I make it worse? What actions and what thought patterns do I have and what results do those give me? If you can see, start to see these patterns that you fall into with your thinking and your actions that end up giving you negative results and you can identify them, you can change them. If you do not uh, see those, um, and then you are blind and you're going to repeat them. It's very, very wise and very true. And it's something I've had to work on, well, had to, I have worked on with myself. There's unconscious patterns that play out and they play out in self-talk or, or reactions to things or fear or you know, the relationship with money, for example. So you might have a scarcity relationship with money, which makes you fearful about funding or cash flow or what have you. Then drives decisions that you feel are rational, but they're actually your view of life based on your patterns of uh, experience, etc. Right, right. Some people are like, it'll turn out fine. I can, I don't, you know, I'll figure out a way. Other people are like, I better take this money, even if it's the wrong person, you know, yes. they'll take the money because they're afraid. Like if I don't take them, they're afraid of not having the money and, and everything going bad. So you have to, like you say, recognize those fears in yourself, your innermost fears, your innermost anxieties and confront them head on. Because otherwise, again, you won't be making the right choices at the right time, especially when there's a lot of stress involved. I found the more stress you're under, whether it's internally produced stress or externally produced, usually it's a combination, but the more stress you're under, the worse decisions you make. Because you, you will tend to make decisions that minimize your stress. Those aren't the decisions that minimize your stress in the short term aren't always the right long term business decisions. So what you need to graph out, where am I stressed about? Why am I making this decision? You know, I want my stress to go down, but does this, uh, this align with my long-term business goals, right? Does it, making this decision now align? So a lot of people take shortcuts with a product, do things that, you know, they shouldn't do, rush a product to market because they're stressed out, that they're running out, you know, all sorts of different decisions, but that end up hurting them later on really important as a business. Person. I think that's really great little, um, I'm going to dwell on this because this is a fantastic insight for anyone in business, but particularly in an early stage in a startup, because your emotional response to a, what is difficult, uncertain, stressful situation is often, like you say, the driver of decisions short and long term. And actually the more you can sit with those uncomfortable feelings and be with it and let it kind of subside and, and be more present um, you aren't driven by those forces. You can kind of master, start to begin to master them. By the way, this is something I, I work on daily, right? Mm. So I have a, Me a, a, a meditation Me and journaling practice in the morning. And generally, not every day, generally I wake up and my kind of mind's racing and I'm fearful about unspecified things, right? I don't know what they are. I'm fearful. And I want to go out and get my laptop and work hard because I need to get the solve the unspecified fear. And it, and it turns out I'm just, my chimp mind is kicking off because of, you know, whatever. And I, if I settle my mind, calm my mind and write out the things I may be fearful of, and it turns out they're not really that big a deal. Yes, but yet they are driving your behavior. Absolutely, um, yeah. It, unless, you, unless you consciously recognize them and then consciously take action. I think that's really good. There's a, there's a, what's springing to mind is that there's a conversation with Tim Ferriss on Tim mm -hmm. Ferriss's podcast with a, a doctor called Gabor Mate. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gabor Mate is a Canadian guy. Um, he's written a, a whole bunch of books about addiction, childhood, uh, parenting, mm. ADHD, uh, mind-body stress connection. And um, I've spoken about him on the podcast a few, a few times. I'm a big fan of his work. But in, in the Tim Ferriss podcast, he runs an exercise which he calls implicit memory. And he mm. asks Tim Ferriss about a time recently when he's been very 
um, had a negative emotion or been stressed. And he, they play this thing out, basically. But it turns out that, he, it, that somebody had pissed him off and he described that this guy was being disrespectful to him. But of course, there are different explanations to why this thing happened. And his pissed offness and his feeling of disrespect was something he'd invented. Right. So he, yes, he, he, and we do this all the time. Absolutely. In our personal relationships and business, it doesn't really matter. We, uh, because of who we are, will impose our own reality on a situation. Exactly. And that. fail to see what's really happening, especially in the other person's mind. And, you know, with somebody like Tim Ferriss, the bigger, the more famous they are, the bigger their ego is, the easier it is. Actually, they become more vulnerable, not less vulnerable to, to slights. You know, if we're like you or I, the guy did the same thing, we might think that's not such a big deal because we don't think we're like deserve like a huge amount of respect. <laughs> we just think we're ordinary people. Somebody like Tim Ferriss may feel like, oh, you know, I, I you know, he should count out of me. I shouldn't be like he shouldn't be making me do this. That is a real danger. And and we see it with these celebrities out there uh, who become prima donnas, you know, and end up sabotaging their own careers and things like that because it becomes so difficult to work. You know, Hollywood is full of these stories, it becomes so difficult to work with. Um, and they're not happy, right? They aren't happy because they feel entitled to a, a different reality than what we the rest of us are in. Yeah, it's so, it's so true. I think that one's ego can be a real enemy to coin a phrase but like so if i'm a founder and i'm kind of um um listening to this now and i'm i'm i'm, I'm confronting these issues and the, the ups and the downs it, it, there's a great line in your book um where you say quotes overcoming extreme doubt is the job of the ceo close quote and i love that because that's just like for me i really resonate with that how does how does somebody overcome this extreme doubt this world of uncertainty this this stress and and all this stuff we're talking about how do you navigate through that what are the tools you'd recommend so doubt, all of us, if we're intelligent, we will doubt because they have actually done a study on entrepreneurs and they have found that the entrepreneurs who are unrealistically, basically delusional, delusionally optimistic, tend to be more successful than really? those who are realists, who see the world for what it really is, because they have this ability to overcome doubt. Like, you know, take somebody like Elon Musk, love him or hate him, right? Yeah, yeah. He he says he's going to take us to Mars. Now, every scientist that you read out there, every serious scientist will tell you it's insane to go to Mars and try to start get a million people living on Mars. I mean, the planet is like makes Earth after we've gone through, you know, the worst climate change possible that you could ever imagine where Earth is like scorching hot and <laughs> becomes toxic. And it makes Earth look like paradise. <laughs> Mars is like, <laughs> like, we might as well stay here and live, you know, and put all the carbon we can into the air and make Earth as unlivable as possible. It still won't be as bad as Mars. Like Mars will be worse. It's like complete. And you have to spend like what you have to sp go 33 million miles to get anything there. And then God hope, you know, you could even ever get back, <laughs> you, know, you know, get off Mars, let alone get onto Mars. Uh, so what it's 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 totally delusional but he has this ability to do that so we're looking at you know us lesser mortals here um you how do you overcome doubt like he apparently can overcome <laughs> a lot of skepticism a lot of doubt which even if he never gets a million people on, on mars even if he gets a few people it would be a huge achievement you know a huge achievement right so but but he's he truly believes he can get like a million people there in an unrealistic amount of time. Um, and he keeps saying it in all his products. He says these things that are unrealistic time frames. Steve Jobs did the same thing, like the impossible, you know, there's a reality distortion in a way you have to distort your reality. So there are times and this is where it gets really tricky. There are times when it's better for you to see reality for what it is, like when you are causing the, the undue stress or anxiety that's going to make you make wrong, wrong decisions. There are other times when it's actually better to live in a fantasy. And this, this, uh, this is where um, you, it becomes so confusing. Right. Because in certain aspects of an entrepreneur, it's much better to be delusional and disconnected from the real world because it'll allow you to do things that you would never attempt. 
And that's what great entrepreneurs do. They do things that seem impossible. And at the same time, you have to be really connected to why you're making decisions on in other areas. And I guess some people naturally have these personalities, like where, you know, like Elon Musk can throw out the stress and dream big and do all these things, you know, and do that. And then others of us uh, really don't have the same uh makeup of our biological being. Uh, we, we didn't get the genetics to do it that way. And then we have to work harder to kind of replicate this. So that's my complex answer to your simple question. No, it's, it's very interesting. And I think this is this relationship, relationship between fantasy and reality is-, yeah, is that, uh, It's all, it, entrepreneurialism exists in this weird nowhere space, right? Between fantasy and reality. Because honestly, that's where humans exist. Like we are never- we never know reality. We only know what's in our head. Like we, everything is filtered through through our imperfect brains. Well, <laughs> we all interpret- have a, we all have a filter, and my bubble of filter, I filter all the information I receive is just different to yours, and it's different to everybody's. And, and maybe right, and I could never be in your head. Like I never will know your reality. I can interpret your reality through your actions. But I will never see your reality for what you see. And that's the strange thing. We're on this planet and all of us, everybody around us is like living in a delusion of their own. And our delusions are like colliding. (laughs) And that's why you get these political differences between people, these religious differences. You know, everybody believes their reality is real. You know, you could be a Muslim, a Jew, an atheist, a Christian. It doesn't Buddhist, you know. It doesn't matter, you, you know, your reality is real to you. And then all these other people are living in these totally different worlds. Some of the, them, God is very talking to them and guiding them through the world. Others believe that everything is, you know, mechanical. And <laughs> some people believe everything's deterministic. Other things believe everything is totally random, you know, and, and, and but we're all exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing, and and it's what a great philosophical discussion. I think we've kind of like, but it's, it's the, there's something in that, and very, but, but I think there's something very, well, for me anyway, I found acknowledging that and, and being aware of all of that allows me to um, manage myself, like uh, my own emotional state and expectations of others, and 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 to exist in entrepreneurial land, the land between fantasy and reality, a little bit more easily than I have yeah, so historically. This is, so I think the, the moral of my story, at least, <laughs> maybe it's not a moral, the, the, but the lesson I've learned is that it doesn't matter if it's real. It matters if it works. Does it work for you? So really smart people figure out what state of mind they need to be in to get the results that will be the best for them and for those around them, the people they care about, society, the values they have, right? So I want to achieve something in this world and uh, I need to understand I function and how this world and and the, the actions I should be taking to get to where I want to go. And then what you're doing is you're saying, I'm never going to live in total reality. I'm always going to distort my reality. I'm always going to change. Like I'll never, but what I can do is say, when I follow these patterns, I get very good results. When I follow these patterns, I'm getting very, I'm not achieving what I want. In fact, I might be going in the opposite direction. I'm actually sabotaging myself. So I'm going to do more of this and less of that. That's great. I mean, yeah. And and very much me personally, the day I, my patterns, uh, that I was following back in uh, leading up to my 2017 were not working or did not, sorry, work. They worked for a period of time, but they, they personally, professionally, lots of things went bad. Yes. Uh, and we I had all have to, had that happen, right? Yeah. It all happened to, and by the way, it was rooted in me. I was propagating out a, um, uh, a, a kind of a, a message to the universe that was basically not going to work for me in the long term. All right. And the universe paid it back and taught me a lesson. But so, so the, almost the thing that I changed was sort of the, the patterns that why uh, is a philosophy of life almost. Like, how do I act? How do the, what are the patterns I should follow that are going to get me the results I want over time? And when I, as soon as I started to go deeper into my myself and change those guess what my life got better on every single aspect and that just exactly what you just said yeah and people will tell themselves simple things like i have to be working all the time i can't you know i can't if I, this company is going to succeed i just have to work all the time so they end up cutting off relationships with their friends uh, because they don't have time to see them they end up uh shortchanging their their 
families, you know, whether it's your partner in life, whether it's your kids, whether it's your parents, whatever. And what ends up happening is that all of a sudden they're living in a very isolated bubble and it becomes, they be, start to become dysfunctional without even knowing it. Like they are actually sabotaging themselves, thinking that they are doing what they have to do to reach their goal. What they have to understand is that you have to create an environment where you thrive. You are never going to create great decisions uh, and make great decisions. And it's not like how hard you work. I've learned this. This is another lesson. Like you can work day and night, 24 hours a day. You're one person. It isn't going to make, it isn't going to move the dial. Like how many hours you put in isn't going to move the dial. What's going to move the dial? is the quality of the decisions you make. The, you know, whether when you come to really hard choices and we make these in life, like should I launch this startup or should I not? That's a huge decision, right? Totally, it's gonna alter the next, you know, three, four, five, 10, 20 years of your life. You know, it, um, when it comes to those, am I making those decisions for the right reason? Um, and, 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 and then every step along the way, every decision I make after that, Am I making it for the right reasons to get the best result? You as a person um, need to work on, on you, the quality of your decision making, not, the, not uh, simply thinking that uh, I can solve the problem by brute force. It's never brute force because to build a company, to build anything successful, you know, unless you're an artist, like a writer, and you can just do it all alone, like by yourself, um, to build any sort of thing that requires an organization means you need to have lots of other people involved, like, you know, a lot of other people. And you don't get those people involved by trying, by working more hours, simply working more hours. You get, you get people involved by connecting with them, by understanding them, by finding out what motivates them. Like biggest on what biggest problem entrepreneurs have at the beginning is how do I get great people on board when I have no money? and a crazy dream. Like I have no money in a crazy dream. I can't even pay them. Like they could go work for Facebook or Microsoft or Google or any other company and get more money than I'm giving them and more opportunity. They would be crazy to work for me. That's realistic. Like they would be nuts. Well, actually most of the people are nuts. We all live in our fantasy world, right? So you just, what you have to do to get those amazing people to jump out of a job that is so much better for them and join your you know, dinky startup and take shares that are worth nothing <laughs> to, to work for you, um, which is a huge risk. Um, you have to get inside their fantasies, just like uh, you get in your own fantasy. You have to join your fantasies with theirs, your unreality with their unreality. And you have to show them that their dream can be your, you share this dream and you're going to do it together. That's what gets people to do things they would never ordinarily do. Gets investors to give you money they shouldn't give you. Gets people to join your startup when they shouldn't join your startup. It gets people to do deals with you when there are other better people out there to do deals with. Amazing. I love it. It's got so much great uh, insight there. And, and they're really, I'm buzzing. I'm going to share my own reality with my people around me. I, I think that's, yes. that's what, that's you what know, I need to you do. Wanna make, you want to make their, you want to make, your company part of their dreams. Like if you want to get great people involved, it can't be they're buying into your dream. Nobody wants to buy into somebody else's dream. They, want to, they, want, they have their own dreams. But if they're, they can see joining your company as a vehicle to achieving what they want to achieve, which is for most people is beyond money. Like we, money is kind of a vehicle to get us to, we, most people crave, we're, we're communal creatures. We crave recognition, status from the people around us. That's what drives us. Like, uh, and then the money, because our society values money so much, we tend to value it, but we only value it. Uh, but what we're really after is not the money itself, because what does money do? It's just a number in your bank account. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, a bigger home, how big a home does a person need? You know, how many cars does a person need? You know, we don't, you know, you could be driving a, you know, a, a nice small car, you know, inexpensive car, and it'll get you anyway, the same as, you know, a Lamborghini will get you might not as be as fast, but it'll get you there. So, uh, this, um, this understanding this is really critical to being successful in your life. Like if you're going to be successful in this world with other people, um, understanding the psychology of human nature, uh, absolutely critical, it'll help yourself with yourself and it'll help you as you push yourself out into the world and engage with all these other minds around you. 
Amazing. Well, we're just edging up to our time. Uh, uh, yes, we've been talking a lot. Oh my God. I, I mean, I could keep going for another kind of Joe Rogan four hour special of this, right? I really could. consciousness on this. I love it. I love it. I'm, 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 I'm seriously, I could do. Uh, so, where, where should people find you, find more about you online? Steve? Okay. So, you can find me a couple places. So, if you want my book, just go to survivingastartup.com. You can go there. If you want to reach me, and I have lots of material on our website with tons of uh, videos, other things, just go to founderspace.com. Founderspace.com. You can reach out to me. You can email me. You can get, engage with all the free material. You can also um, find me on all the social networks. A great one is LinkedIn. Search for Founderspace, Steve Hoffman, Captain Hoff. Captain Hoff. Get him online. Check him yes! out. Check all his stuff. I mean, listen, you get a small taste of, 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 of the, the mind behind all this great content. So please check him out. It's been an absolute joy for me. So um, great to see you. Uh, Captain Half, happy to have you on the podcast. And I'll see you everybody next time. Do you want to get the top five tip bits from each episode email to your inbox every Friday? Yes, you do. It saves you having to go through and make notes and make a note of all the books and all the ideas that are in the podcast. We go through, we choose the top five we like, plus put all the links into that email. So if you just go up to honeyibleweupthebusiness.com, yes, that's honeyibleweupthebusiness.com, and just enter your email address. There's a little box, just enter it in, and we will send you that information. And it saves you having to make notes and all that. That's uh, make your life a bit easier. And of course, if you did enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing. We are trying to help people through this. So the more people that subscribe, review, rate on Apple, Google, Podcasts, Spotify, the more people will see it and the more we can help. So help us help other people, other entrepreneurs like you. And before I go, I've got to say big up to my company, the tech department, the company we blew up and put back together again. They're generously supporting me on this mission through the podcast. So if you guys want to have a look at a company that can really help you improve your technology, make it better so your business gets better to boosting your sales and your profit and a bit more sanity in your life, a little less stress, then head up to the techdept.com, the tech department, uh, my company. Uh, give us a look. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening. And I'll see you next time.